welcome to this video in the periodic table chapter. This is 4.1, the periodic table. Today we are going to begin our journey into the periodic table unit and we are going to be discussing the contributors to the organization and the design of the periodic table. We're going to discuss the properties used to arrange the various periodic tables through history and introduce to you guys something called periodic law. If you haven't already done so, please make sure you have your chemistry notebook, your writing utensil, and of course you're going to need to print a blank periodic table to annotate as we go. So without any further ado, let's get cooking. You're all probably looking at this saying to yourselves, hey, I know what that is. That is the periodic table. And it looks very much like the one that is most likely hanging in your classroom today. But prior to the periodic table looking like this, well, Pre-periodic table history was quite a mess with no real organization to the elements at all. Scientists had just combined information about elements on lists. And I liken that to going into a grocery store and having a mess. Now, you're used to grocery stores looking like this, where we have organization of all the foods that they are selling, and it is all organized by type, and it is neat, and it is arranged, and you know exactly where to find things. You know that there are going to be similarities between the food items, like for instance here we got a lot of juices and drinks, and of course here we have my favorite, we have hot sauces. And in general, you know, like foodstuffs are going to be grouped together so you can go directly to where you want to find the things that you need. Well, imagine your grocery store looked something like this, where there's no organization. There might be all the things that you need in this store that's here, but you just may not be able to find them because there's no rhyme or reason to the arrangement of the items. Pre-periodic table chemistry was similar to that. All the elements were on a list somewhere, but that list was jumbled and disorganized. So let's start talking about how we went from information about elements that was completely disorganized to the elegant table we saw at the beginning of this video. So let's put that time machine in reverse and go way back to before the modern periodic table, beginning with Antoine Lavoisier. Now, you may remember his name from one of the very first units we did where we talked about the law of conservation of mass. Well, in terms of periodic table history, Lavoisier in 1789 did author a book based on many of his experiments and his findings, and he appropriately called that chemistry. I have never read that because the book is in French, and I'm lucky that I speak English. But... The most important thing that he really did was organize the 33 elements at the time into a table format. Now, you'll see here on this slide, it says elements in quotes because there are some things there that are not elements and are compounds. And he called this table his list of simple substances. And he based it all on reactivity with oxygen and other elements. So take a look at what this is here and you can see he has a bunch of elements that are listed nitrogen carbon sulfur etc uh he does have aluminum oxide which is here which uh, and silicon dioxide which we know are indeed compounds he also lists light and heat here which are not elements at all but at least he did make some headway and he did so because he was looking for similarities between the properties of the elements and what they reacted with after Antoine Lavoisier, we can now meet Mr. Johann Wolfgang Doberiner. Now, Doberiner furthered the development of the periodic table by offering something called the model of triads. He started grouping elements together that had similar chemical properties. Now, let's take, for instance, lithium, sodium, and potassium. Today, we take for granted that those are all group one elements, and they all react similarly with similar things, and that's the reason that they're in a group. But if you go back, you know, hundreds of years, nobody knew that, and this was relatively new information. So what Doberiner found was that all of those elements reacted similarly with water at room temperature. They reacted with chlorine to form compounds in a one-to-one -one ratio. They combined also with hydrogen to form compounds and hydroxide to form compounds with similar formulas. And it is due to these patterns and reactivity that Doberiner felt he should put these three elements in a set. 
One of the interesting things that Dobereiner also found by organizing his elements in sets of three was that the atomic mass of your middle element in each triad was about equal to the mean of the atomic masses of the first and third elements. So this was a really cool finding and gave Dobereiner quite a lot of critical acclaim. Now, the biggest problem was that there were some limitations using this triad model. Dobereiner could only identify three triads. So we're talking nine elements out of, you know, 40 or 50 so elements that existed at the time. So the rest of those elements that exist couldn't fit into a triad and had dissimilar properties. So we had to shelf that Dobereiner work for the meantime, but not for long. The next guy we should talk about is Mr. John Newlands. And this is now in 1865. Newlands contributed something called the law of octaves that will state when elements are arranged in increasing order of atomic weight as they called it back then it wasn't called atomic mass yet every eighth element will have similar properties to the first and the idea of octaves comes from the piano where if you go eight white keys this way in this direction or eight white keys in that direction you will find a repeating note and again, this is a foreshadowing of something called periodic law, which we're going to get to in a few. Enter now the father of the periodic table, Mr. Dmitry Mendeleev. We are now starting to get into the MVPs of the history of the periodic table. And Mendeleev is our first contestant here. Mendeleev is credited with organizing the very first periodic table in 1869, and he did so actually as part of a lesson plan to try and help his students understand a little bit about chemical properties and physical properties of elements, and he arranged them in a grid-like pattern. Here we see the Mendeleev periodic table. Now, there are a couple things that should jump out at you right off the bat. First thing you're going to see is that the element is listed here with its mass number next to it. And you'll see that the elements progress up the table based on atomic mass. You will also notice that across the top, there are eight groupings, which is a throwback to the John Newland's octaves or octaves that we saw on a previous slide. You're going to also notice that when you go down groups, Dmitry Mendeleev had his elements grouped by similar chemical properties. So that is also a throwback to Johann Dobereiner. So it is important to pause the video now and make sure you get down what the Mendeleev contribution was. Even though some of his ideas are borrowed and it is a little bit like Lady Gaga who borrowed, let's say, from Madonna, it's all right because it was a repackaging and really the first time that someone had put forth an amalgam of all the different ideas. So pause the video now, take this down, and when you're done, let's keep going. One of the other things you may be wondering is like, how could he have become so famous if all he did was repackage stuff that came before him? Well, it gets deeper than that. Check this out. Here we have the Mendeleev periodic table, and I will call your attention to these spots here where it looks like there are no elements, but what Mendeleev did was start to try and predict the existence of elements that had not been found yet. And he went so far as to predict their properties and their masses. We are looking right now at a prediction of an element called Eka Aluminum by Mr. Mendeleev himself. So Dmitry Mendeleev said, all right, I think that there is an element that exists between aluminum and what was yttrium at the time. And I think it's gonna have the following properties. It's gonna react in a two to three ratio with oxygen. It should dissolve in acid. It should form salts, etc., etc., etc. And then he goes on to list a whole bunch of information. And we know that this element eventually turned out to be gallium. Uh, but when it was found, you can look here at the prediction of the properties that Mendeleev proposed and then what the actual properties of gallium were when it showed up so super unique and cool that he was actually able to do that and that is the reason why Mendeleev is considered by many a genius and gets the critical acclaim that he deserves 
Please make sure you stop the video now and you take down what made Mendeleev important and famous. Remember, he left blank spaces for undiscovered elements and accurately predicted the properties of elements that had yet to be discovered. And eventually they did get discovered in his lifetime, which is when he got all the praise. So things weren't 100% rosy all the time using the Mendeleev model of the periodic table. There were some discrepancies. Take, for example, the fact that tellurium and iodine were next to one another. Now, if we are proceeding from left to right on the periodic table, technically, on the Mendeleev table, tellurium has a higher atomic mass than iodine does, and they technically should be flipped. But if we put iodine in group 16, that would be a problem because iodine had chemical properties that were similar to fluorine, chlorine, bromine, etc., and then obviously iodine. And if we put it over in group 16, it did not have the same properties as, let's say, oxygen, sulfur, or selenium. So they kept the table the way that it was and disregarded the inconsistencies of mass in favor of the idea that elements with similar properties should remain in columns or as we call them, groups. This now takes us to the modern periodic table. That is the periodic table we use today, and it is due in large part to a man named Henry Mosley. That is this guy that is right here, handsome devil that he is. Let's talk a little bit about the Mosley table. You will notice that this is the table that we arrange based on increasing atomic number. And it was through the Mosley experiments where he found this relationship equating atomic number, aka nuclear charge, and the number of protons that elements have. And he found that when you arrange those elements by increasing atomic number, every element would have a different one. And a few of the Mendeleev discrepancies would now disappear. You would still have elements that had similar properties in groups, but you wouldn't have these mass issues. Mosley's experiment is a pretty cool one and involves shooting small tiny particles called beta particles at the nuclei of atoms. And this was an early form of X-ray spectroscopy. Now, first thing you got to know is a beta particle is essentially an electron. So it's a negatively charged particle. And on impact, he found that each element, because he, he was shooting them at all the different elements sort of that he knew, and he found that each of those elements would emit an X-ray, which was a unique frequency. So in crunching some of the numbers, when Mosley actually plotted the square root of the X-ray frequency by the atomic number, he found that he was getting a straight line. And that the atomic number based on this is equal to the amount of charge in the atom's nucleus. And because each element had a different charge, those atoms could therefore be differentiated and arranged by this. He found that by arranging the elements in terms of now atomic number and not Mendeleev's atomic mass, it got rid of the discrepancies like tellurium and iodine or cobalt and nickel, which is one we didn't really talk about on the other slide. It is through the findings on the Mosley experiment that he created a new periodic table based on something called periodicity, which is repeating properties in a pattern, and said that properties of elements, both physical and chemical, will occur periodically when arranged by atomic number. And that is now known as something called periodic law. So that is the basis for our entire chemistry course. And it is all because Henry Mosley now grouped his elements on his table by increasing atomic number. It gave us that periodicity. And that is the model that is still in use today. So that is pretty much it for this lesson. We have gone all the way from Antoine Lavoisier all the way to Henri Mosley and discussed how the periodic table evolved and has changed to that beautiful version that we know of today. Remember, if anything is bugging you or there are any burning or lingering questions, please bring them to the burning questions segment during our next session. It's been a pleasure to take you through periodic table history. I will see you all on the flip side. Peace out. That's all, folks.